So we're going to cover, at one level, we're going to cover microscopes. And so I thought I'd give you an array here going from the material that we'll talk about later, uh, next lecture mostly, which is the stuff that Robert Hooke did using a microscope primarily of the sort that you can see here. That is, it's in the diagram, it's a microscope of two lenses, one here and one here, and a tube. Uh, it's interesting that the tube in, the di in this picture is certainly uh, cylindrical, while, while in the diagram it's a bit less. That was the type of microscope that he used, and you'll see, to get quite a lot of very interesting images. People were also working with single lens microscopes, and that's the sort of thing that you see here, which is the von Leeuwenhoek style microscope. Not just from von Leeuwenhoek, but lots of other people. You could hold one of these in the palm of your hand. And although it's hard to see in these pictures, right over here is a small spherical lens that's sort of wedged in between these two plates of, of brass. Those lenses were as small as a half a millimeter in diameter. I mean, they're really tiny. And there's quite an essay, quite an interest in how those lenses were made. And I'll go through that uh, as we get to discuss some of von Leeuwenhoek's work. So we then take this extraordinary jump in terms of instrumentation. Well, a simple microscope, which now looks more or less like this, that is to say it has eyepieces and, and a frame and lenses that you can look at. That's the sort that you're more or less familiar with as a standard laboratory microscope. That design didn't started to emerge at the end of the 19th century, maybe even earlier than that. So there was a big gap between the 17th century and the 19th century in terms of microscope design. And you'll see how that became relevant. Then somewhere in the mid 1900s, we started to see the development of things like this, which is, this is an early electron microscope. It looks like it came out of a submarine or something, but this is one made in the laboratories of RCA, which in the 1950s was a major manufacturer of microscopes, interestingly enough, of electron microscopes. And then within another 50, 60 years, we have the development of an electron microscope that now looks something like this that fills up a room. Uh, you have to imagine a scale by thinking about somebody sitting at this table. And then the expansion of the more conventional microscope into something like this, which now has video controls and actually a whole bunch of electronic controls of the stage that is actually a confocal microscope. So there's been quite an evolution in machines. And so we'll talk a little bit about that development of the, the machines themselves and the way that they were modified. And this will become one of the themes that goes through this course is how these microscopes were evolving, if you will. So we have this progression of microscopes going from single to multiple lenses all the way down through various levels of sophistication. And also left out in a formal way is the idea of the, the use of the electron microscope. But we'll, we'll get to all of that with time. But at the same time, what goes on in this course as well is the progression in what we understand about the world. And I, I can't, assume that I'm going to present absolutely, you know, a full physics course and a full cell biology course and a full microscopy history course. So we'll be dancing along a lot of these ideas as we move through the course. But clearly one of the things we're going to hit as part of this is a discussion about 
changes of what we understand about the physical world and the understanding of what light is, other forces like gravity and electronics, and then the idea of moving gradually towards the understanding of molecular structure, and then this incredible world of, of quantum effects, all of which has bearing on how we understand life. And then we're gonna talk about life itself. And again, if we follow a kind of a historical perspective, I can see more or less going through the early discovery of cells, not even knowing what their significance was, but then eventually learning about the, the tissues that were in, that involved by the organization of these cells learning more about the internal structure of the cells. So substructure, organelles, fine structure, eventually the dynamics within cells. But then I think we can add yet an additional set of information in sort of biological significance. By which I mean, we know about cells, but how do cells relate to the function of living organisms, okay? Some of it's really obvious. So all of this stuff of cells make up the basics of the tissues that we look in. But the, the, one of the great mysteries in history was what is called the problem of generation. Which I'm gonna put in a sort of peculiar word, a phrase, which is where do babies come from? That is, it's extraordinary to realize that what we now know of the history of things like sperm and egg fertilization was quite a mystery until the middle of the 19th century. Even though people had observed cells and had observed sperm, had observed egg, there was an enormous debate about how this thing actually turned into a, a fully formed adult, ultimately. And we're gonna to get to that as we go through this history. I mean, these, these things all weave together. In, in this fascinating, to me, fascinating world. So where do we go with this? Well, the idea then, as I suggested, is that what we're going to do is start with some of the people who were involved at the beginning of these observations. A man named von Leeuwenhoek, you've all heard about. Robert Hooke, you're going to hear more than you want to know about. Jan Swammerdam, who did major work on the emergence. He, it was very interesting. He showed, imagine that somebody had to show this, that the life cycle of an insect involved the, in, the formation of an egg, a larva, a pupa, and then finally an adult, that all those different things that people had seen were actually the same organism. That's kind of mind blowing to realize that had to be thought of, because you all know that, and it becomes so integral into your knowledge, it's kind of a surprise to know that people actually had to prove these things. Then the stuff I wanna then talk about is as microscopes improved, we start to get to the work that starts organizing cells into tissue. So we get to the Schleiden and Schwann, Virchow, and the work by Brown, Brown is a name you probably don't know, except through physics, because he's the one associated with the term of Brownian motion from the, again, the turn of the 19th century. And then we'll talk about this whole business about how my, microscopes have been modified over the years, much of it during the 20th century, leading to phase contrast and differential interference. These are all interesting ways of manipulating optics that led to both the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. 
and then onward to some of these remarkable new fluorescence techniques using fluorescence micro, uh, confocal microscopy and eventually super resolution. I will try my best to keep the physics details to a minimum, unless you're desperate for it. But I, I do want to introduce some of those ideas as we go along. OK, so how do I look at this thing? Well, for the fun of it, I made up this chart. You can't read all the names that are on it. But what I did was I set up a timeline of where the significant figures are in the history that I want to cover in the history of microscopy. And a couple of very interesting things start to emerge. First of them is that there's this burst of information, burst of activity towards the, the end of the 17th century. And the interesting thing that you've got is this is when you have Robert Hooke, von Leeuwenhoek, uh, Swammerdam. You have a couple of other interesting names in here that I, I just felt I had to include. There's a very famous artist named Johannes Vermeer. And it turns out that he and von Leeuwenhoek were neighbors. There's some very interesting relationship between Vermeer who presumably used a lot of optics in his painting. I don't know if we'll get to that during the course, but, and then at the end, it turns out Vermeer uh, von Leeuwenhoek was the executor of Vermeer's estate after Vermeer died. So there's some interesting interactions that we'll cover a little bit. But then here's this remarkable thing from somewhere around 1810, 1710, which is the about here, up until the, the middle of the, uh, the 19th century or beginning of the 19th century, so 1820, there's a gap in terms of significant people. It's a funny way to criticize, to, to review the world, but it's as if the pace of observation, excitement and discovery sort of petered out. The only thing that might be interesting to you is that it's somewhere around here in about uh, 1750 is when Benjamin Franklin announced the discovery of the lightning rod, did his, his lightning experiment. So it's, it's a kind of a funny perspective. But in terms of our understanding of biology, there was a real gap in that period. Then we come to this period over here in the 19th century, where we start talking a lot about tissue organization and pathology. And then as microscopes become improved quite a bit, we get to the manufacture area over here where Zeiss and his compatriots put together what are now the sort of the modern transmission microscopes. And then somewhere in this period in the 20th century, we then start to get the development of things like phase contrast and DIC, and also the development of the electron microscopes, both types. So there are these interesting sort of periods that I think make sense as a way to look to organize the history that we're going to go through. So here's, here's the way I'm going to start. The basic idea then is to think of it until as these sorts of chapters. The first is the one I just outlined. And I'm going to discuss before the end of today, this interesting organization, Royal Society in London, which was a focus for a great deal of a lot of the work that developed at that time in this sort of burgeoning of scientific enlightenment. And then jump right ahead to the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, the development of various kinds of microscope adapters. But then as the electron microscope became into its own, 
the development of what we would now call a field of cell biology. Okay. And then when we enter the 21st century, we enter in a couple of ways, the advanced microscope techniques that are primarily based on fluorescence, which is interesting in itself, but then some extra techniques like what are now called light sheet microscopes and cryo-electron microscopy, which has led to some very, very high resolution imaging. So that's the shape of, of the way the course will go. Let me start with some thoughts about the uh, 17th century. And early on, so what you've got at the top of it, more or less what I was thinking about, but I thought it might be worth mentioning a few very brief, and I might call them ideas at my level, okay? That is very peripheral, very superficial ideas about what people, what ideas were like, what the, what the changes were as that, that uh, century started to develop. Remembering that it was actually at the turn of that century, 1600 something, that Galileo's work became available. And people suddenly became aware that there were moons, that there were structures on the planets, the specifically the structures on, um, on the moon and the presence of moons around Jupiter. All of those things changed people's perspective of the world enormously as it happened. And at the same time this emerged, what the conflict was, was the sense of a conflict between authority going back either to the church or to the Greeks, to Aristotle, on the way things were, what was the structure of the world, what was known about the world, instead of, and again to us this is sort of an odd thought, instead of actually checking it out. That is, the philosopher that introduced this was Francis Bacon, who introduced the idea that one should do experiments, that one should actually use one's own experience as a way of determining the way the world was set up. This was a philosophical change. It was an enormous difference. And it was part of the way people started moving into what we now think of as modern science. The Bacon more or less said, you know, it's okay not to look just at authority, but in fact, to go back to it, to go to your own personal experience to see where things, how things are structured. And similarly, there is a lot of interest, much more frustrating, I must say, much harder to understand, in the nature of material itself. Aristotle, who said, you know, they're basically the four elements, to people like Descartes, who started saying, well, no, maybe, maybe tissues, maybe the world is, is, convolved, is involved or composed of small particles, particles so small we can't see them, but that, and here's where Descartes may have been wrong, they're all basically the same. They're moving around, but the way they accumulated caused a change in what they were. But the idea that there were particles was again something that dominated the theories of actually that entire century and maybe even beyond. As you probably know, we're still thinking about particles in, in the structure of matter, right? various kinds of particles. So all of this created a kind of an intellectual ferment that was taking place at, at an intellectual level among people that were thinking about the way the world worked. And then superimposed on all this was, you know, a bit of an English history, which is not something I know very much about, I have to admit. But it turns out to be relevant here. And the reason it mattered was that there was a, 
a king, Charles I, who was thought actually the problem among others was that he was thought to be too closely associated with the church. And he eventually was driven out and executed. He was executed in 1649. In doing some research on this, I came across the, what I guess is the high school AP lectures course structure on this part of English history. And in it, there's a picture of Charles I. Caption says, here's a portrait of Charles I with his head still attached because his, his execution was by beheading. Somebody had a great sense of humor about this. From the period after his death, for 10 years, there was no monarchy as such in England. And England sort of experimented with a parliamentary form of government with a couple of different structures. Finally, they were dominated by a man named Oliver Cromwell, who introduced his own form of restrictions and Puritanism to society. But during that time, people had a kind of a freedom to think about things, not to be forced to follow a particular king's rules, but to actually develop some of these their own independent ideas. At least that's the way I'm interpreting this period. And then finally in 1660 or so, Charles II was introduced as brought in as the king, more or less to resolve the problems that Cromwell had introduced. Now, so during this period, this interregnum, interregnum, the regnum means is a, a term for regi, which is the term for the king. So it's an interregnum between kings. During that time, some people who were clearly thinking about structure of the world, various other aspects, started meeting in, in Oxford. They became the Oxford group. Most of them were royalists. And the story is that they would get together either monthly or weekly and have meetings at which they would present to each other, talk to each other about what they were thinking, what they were learning sort of a remarkable little club of, of proto-scientists, if you will. And you can see that this is a fairly impressive collection of people. Here's a person who was an astronomer but became the treasurer of the society. This Bronker was a vis vis viscount. People who come out of a wealthy background people that were unusually rich for one reason or another. And then a few people like Sir Robert Moray, who was one of these people who made connections between people. So he was, as you can see, he was born at the beginning of the century. He was known to both of the Charles Kings and to the French Cardinals. He was one of those people who connected the power, the, the people of power with this kind of uh, nascent scientific group. And then what I then think found interesting was that this was the group that the claim is, they went to a lecture given by a man named Christopher Wren, and we'll talk about Christopher Wren in a moment. And after his lecture, they went back to their smoking rooms or wherever it was and sat around and talked and said, you know, maybe we should try to formalize this group. And in order to formalize the group, the idea was to form a society that existed with the blessing of the king. And that's why they ended up creating, because of mores and other influences, they formed what was then called the, the Royal Society. It had a much more elaborate name, the Royal Society for the Establishment of Knowledge and Understanding, something like that. But it's now referred to as the Royal Society. 
And then within a year or two, this group formed initially in this kind of way, like a, a fraternity, if you will, incorporated several additional people. This is within 63, and it included some people, a couple of whom you probably know of. So Robert Boyle is now known because of Boyle's Law, right? Which related pressure to the volume in a chamber. And you've all, anyone who's taken physics course has tried to understand PD equals NRT, right? And that's, that's um, Boyle's Law. Um, he was also considered almost the founder of chemistry. He was a person who experimented a great deal with the, the composition of materials by breaking them down and learning about them. There was Christopher Wren, whose name I've already mentioned. Christopher Wren is thought of as the most famous acclaimed, as you see, English architects. He, um, and you'll hear some of his story when I get back to uh, Robert Hooke in the next lecture or two. He was a real polymath and brilliant and a prodigy when he started out. So he started out very early understanding mathematics. He was an anatomist, a great deal of early work in structure of, of some biological materials. He was an astronomer in the sense that he and Robert Hooke, who again we'll talk about later, that Robert Hooke and he mapped the position of comets early on, a couple of different comets, before Edmund Halley came up with Halley's Comet, which happened later in, the, in that century. But he was, as well as an astronomer, he was apparently a man of extraordinary drawing ability. He was an artist, a skilled, skilled draftsman. And we'll get to this story, but after, in 1665, London suffered through an enormous fire that burned down two thirds or more of the city itself. And he was one of the people involved in the rebuilding. And he is known for having rebuilt many, many of the churches in London as the architect involved with them. The most famous, if you go to London, is St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a beautiful, beautiful landmark. John Wilkins, Wilkins is a name you don't hear very much. He was one of those people who was a catalyst for the science within the organization. One of those people who knew a lot of people and pulled it, pulled it together, even though he was from the clergy, he was clearly very interested in the new tools for learning about things. Once again, you're gonna see this sense of names that pop up here and there. Christian Huygens, pardon my Dutch, was another one of the people, you'll see his name later on, but he worked with Alexander Bruce, who clearly was a man of, of some, some resources, but who also was a politician, a judge, and an inventor. And he and Huygens were involved in trying to develop a clock that could be used in, in the sea, ocean. This, there was a book called Longitude that came out many years, a couple of years ago, about the quest for a watch or a clock that could work on the when you were out at the sea, because that was the way you could navigate. If you knew what time it was, you knew what the stars were expected to do, depending on where you were. So this was all part of the same ferment that was going on. And the first of, of portraits, I'm not a great one for showing portraits, but I thought this was sort of cool. They recruited this team recruited a man by the name of Henry Oldenburg, who was actually German to begin with, but who had migrated across Europe. And so had many connections with many people in many of the countries in Europe at that time. And he formed an incredible network 
of people in, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in England, in France, so that when, he, when the idea was formed of this royal society, they called on him to be what became the, the secretary, that is the person to really coordinate the society. And you'll notice that in addition to him, John Wilkins, who was the other coordinating type of person, brought this unit together as a scientific society. Oldenburg, as you see, did a couple of other interesting things. As the central force in this Royal Society, over the years, people would send him reports. I've just been to this, ver to this place and I've seen these sorts of organisms or I've seen this sort of structure. And I've been thinking about the structure of the moon and I've been thinking, these people would write in letters manuscripts of one form or another, they would send them to Oldenburg and Oldenburg then both reviewed them and sent them out to other people to say, hey, what do you think of this? Eventually what he did was publish this material in what became one of the oldest scientific journals, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which is still available and which is available online. And you can actually read the philosophical uh, transactions from 1670, as well as the ones from last week by going to their website. It's really kind of an extraordinary world. And then we will add into this list of initial founders of the Royal Society, a group of people who then became the core of what I would think of as sort of modern, at least at that time, modern beginnings of, of biological science and science in general. And these are the names that are now gonna become increasingly familiar to you. So Robert Hooke, who I'm gonna spend more time than you expect on, he's known in biological terms as the man that first saw cells in cork but he did an enormous amount more. And that's why I wanna spend some time with him next lecture. But in addition, there were Christian Huygens, who was a Dutchman, who among other things designed a spring loaded watch, a watch that operated on springs, but who actually came up with, a, with the wave theory of light, or at least one part of it, relating to interference and we'll discuss how that plays out. There's Antoni von Leeuwenhoek, and he, is, um, he himself deserves at least a lecture on, on his interests and on his uh, observations. Then a couple of others, Marcello Marpighi was in Italy and doing a lot of work on, on insect anatomy at an extraordinary level of detail. So he was the one that came up with the observation that in fact, insects don't have internal lungs, but that they take in air through tubes that extend to the surface of their body. This is the Malpighian tubules that we now know. Isaac Newton probably needs no introduction, but probably deserves one. Again, one of the, the true brilliant figures of that time period who's associated with showing that, first of all, with, with developing the calculus along with Leibniz and the great battle there of who really did it. But he is given a great deal of credit for using it then to calculate the way that the orbits of the planets could be accounted for by using this force of gravity and the idea of an inverse square power function that the further away two objects went from each other, the force between them decreased as the square of their difference, as their distance. So Isaac Newton is of course a major figure in all of this. His idea about the structure of light 
which created real problems for the next century or two, was also the basis, part of the basis, for an enormous battle between him and Robert Hooke, uh, in which Newton won. We'll cover some of that discussion later on. Another of the names that's going to show up, as I mentioned earlier, was Jan Swammerdam, who was again a microscopist mostly, who was very interested in the structure of insects and the development of insects. So we'll cover all of these people as we go along. In the next lecture, we'll begin a discussion about Robert Hooke and the contributions that he made to the use of the microscope at the end of the 17th century.